Christ is supreme. And there is nothing and there is nobody in all of creation that compares to him. Christ's power to save us is greater than the law's power to condemn us. Even your best deeds will not save you. And if you're counting on your own good deeds for your salvation, if you're counting on your own goodness as your hope, it is really just a rejection of Christ. And thus, your best deeds, all of your good deeds, all they do is condemn you. bow our hearts and heads in a moment of prayer. Our gracious Father, we thank you that your word is so powerful and so clear on certain things that we need to know, such as the futility of works unto salvation, the idea, Lord, that our Salvation is not contingent upon anything that we do. Because in our hearts and in our minds, we're so inclined to work for our salvation. But Lord, the passage that we look at today certainly corrects that type of thinking. And so I pray, Lord, that as we study your word, that you would draw us more resolutely to trust in Christ entirely to see our need for him, to see the, the utter need that we have for grace and the full provision that is found in Christ. So use this time, Lord, to teach us, to correct us, to strengthen us, that Christ would be glorified in our lives. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible with you, Go ahead and turn to John chapter 1, the gospel according to John. We're still looking at chapter 1, and today we're actually stepping it up a bit, and we're going to get wild and crazy and cover more than just one verse. We're going to actually cover four verses today. Uh, We're going to be looking at verses 15 to 18. Quite a few years ago, one of the more popular uh, talk shows that you could find on TV was Larry King Live. Those of us who are old, it doesn't seem like uh, that long ago, uh, but he's retired now. This show isn't, uh, isn't, what it, isn't the, the premier talk show on cable networks anymore. But there was one episode that I found particularly interesting called What Happens When We Die?, What happens when we die? In fact, if you want, when you go home, look that up on YouTube. It is an absolutely fascinating discussion. Um, It's about 45 minutes long, but it's very much worth your time to watch. And on this show, on this particular episode, Larry King brought together a panel, as he would commonly do, uh, this panel consisting of a Jewish rabbi, a Muslim, a Roman Catholic priest, a New Age guru, and a well-known and... uh, and doctrinally sound Christian pastor. And while all of the panel members, except, well, there there was an atheist too, uh, except the atheist affirmed that there is life after death, when it came to the question at hand, what happens when we die, you might think that each one of these individuals, each one of these represented uh, religions would have had a very different answer, but actually the opposite was true. There was actually something of a consensus among everyone, except the Christian pastor, and as you might expect, the atheist. What happens after we die? That was the question. Well, according to everybody except the pastor and the atheist, you'll either face rewards or punishment depending on how good you are in this life. So the way to get to heaven, each one of them affirmed, is by good works. The Jewish rabbi said this, he said, people who live righteously with righteous conduct go to the eternal world. Admission to that world is based on righteous conduct, end quote. The Muslim added, people will go to heaven and eternity or face consequences of punishment, and this depends on good works, 
end quote. And of course, the New Age guru and the Roman Catholic priest offered what was essentially the same answer in a lot of words. But of course, the Christian pastor, as one of the two descending voices on this panel, affirmed that one's admission to heaven is through faith in Jesus Christ. And sadly, when you're talking to to people in church, this should go without saying But in our day and age, there are plenty of people who claim to be Christians, pastors included, by the way, who think that salvation comes through some combination of faith plus works. And this reveals something that that Scripture clearly reveals, and so it shouldn't surprise us, and that is that all the religions in the world are rebellious attempts to get to heaven by some means other than the means which God has provided Anyone who trusts in their own works for salvation is leaning on a crutch that cannot support their weight. But we saw the same thing in Jesus' day, didn't we? Isn't that what the religious leaders all did? Isn't that what they all depended on? Isn't that what they all taught? They looked to the law of Moses for salvation. They believed that if they were just close enough to following it perfectly, if they were just good enough that their lives would be pleasing to God and they would have eternal life. But Jesus said that for this very reason, they were like whitewashed tombs. That is, they're beautiful on the outside, they're nice and clean on the outside, but on the inside, they're just full of death. Here's the problem with the idea that we get to heaven by being good enough. And the problem is this, how good? How good? How good does a person have to be? I mean, the priest was actually asked that question. He had no idea. Same for the rabbi. He's asked that question, really doesn't know how to answer it. The Muslim, same thing. How many good works? I don't know. I don't know. And, and, and that was the question, actually, if you, if you remember from the Reformation, that was the question that drove Martin Luther to the brink of insanity. And it's the same question that anybody who trusts in their own works, in their own goodness, in their own righteousness, must face and yet cannot answer. Larry King, as he's cutting the break, he, he adds his two cents. He says he hopes that 51% would be enough. The 51% would be a passing grade on God's scale, revealing that he actually has the same misunderstanding that almost everybody on the panel had, and that is that they have not, like, like all of us, they have never done anything truly good by God's standard in their lives. So even if we say it's 51%, all of humanity on our own would be at zero. It would be grace if God said 1% is passing. No, all of us would score a zero because every single one of our thoughts, words, and deeds is corrupted by sin. So what does God require? If it's not 51%, what does God require? 100%. He tells us what he requires. Jesus said, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. It's from Matthew 5, 48. The truth is that if we look to the law for salvation, if we look to our good works uh, based on the law for salvation, it's like waiting for a plastic chicken to lay an egg. It's not going to happen. It's, it's just not going to happen because it wasn't designed for that purpose. No, God gave us something better than the law to save us. He sent his only son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to uphold and fulfill the law on behalf of all who would forsake every effort for earning their salvation by their good works, and instead of that, placing saving faith in Christ for salvation. So as we continue our study of the gospel according to John today, we're going to be looking at what you call the preeminence of Christ. Now, I understand most of you kids, you've probably never heard the word preeminent. Uh, It's kind of a big word. We don't use it a lot, so you probably don't need to remember it for everyday conversation, but when you're talking about Jesus, it's a good word to know how to use, and your friends will ask, what does that mean? So you'll get a chance to talk about Jesus with them. If you're not familiar with the term preeminent, the dictionary definition is this, quote, surpassing all others, very distinguished in some way. And of course, when we're talking about Jesus, he certainly surpasses all others, and he's distinguished in every way. 
But John undoubtedly knew that people would want to go to heaven some other way than by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. John's already told us in the previous passages all this great information about Jesus. And in the previous verse, he told us that Jesus is the unique Son of God, that there is nobody else like him. There is nobody else who qualifies to save us. It's only Jesus. But he's not only unique, he is also preeminent. That is, he is supreme. He surpasses all others. He's better than any other alternative. He's the only one who's qualified to save us. He's more distinguished. He's more righteous, more just, more holy, more worthy than any and every other historical figure. And that's the point of our passage today. Because Jesus is preeminent, because he is supreme over everything and everyone else, only Jesus is worthy of our devotion and our worship. So in verse 14, John told us, we saw his glory, speaking about Jesus, we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And John's going to expound on that in the verses that follow by holding up some of the things, some of the alternatives that people commonly trust in other than Christ for salvation as a means of showing us, as a means of John the Apostle showing us that Jesus is preeminent, that Jesus is supreme, that Jesus is greater than all. So let's look at verse 15 together. He says, John, speaking of John the Baptist, John testified about him and cried out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. So John the Baptist was a prophet. Uh, He was a preacher, uh, an evangelist who had quite a following and rightfully so. I mean, uh, this was a guy who was bold. This is a guy who had courage. This is a guy who was willing to say what needed to be said. And he was also a guy who spoke on God's behalf after 400 years of silence between God and Israel. He courageously called people to repent. He boldly spoke out about the corruption and the hypocrisy of the religious leaders. John the Baptist even confronted the king, King Herod, about this about his sin, which ultimately, as we know, led to the death of John the Baptist. Now, it would have been easy for people to think that John the Baptist was worthy of the highest honor and the highest esteem. Jesus called him the greatest of the prophets. And in our day and age, when we think about this, in our day and age, there are so many celebrity pastors and celebrity teachers out there. And part of that is the internet, part of it is uh, Christian bookstores, but there are tons of celebrity pastors and teachers out there. And I think we're all at least somewhat prone to make the same mistake, to make the mistake of following those people and setting our eyes on those people rather than setting our eyes on Christ. But what we see here in verse 15 is that John the Baptist wanted nothing to do with that. He didn't want all the praise. He didn't want all the accolades. He didn't want all the attention. John the author tells us what John the Baptist said. He said, this was he of whom I said, who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. In other words, even before this point, even before he's he's preaching in front of all of his followers, and even before he sees Jesus, he's been telling them that there's coming somebody who's greater than he is. So they shouldn't be following John the Baptist. They should be following the one who was greater than he was, who existed before he did. Now, this had to be kind of a weird thing to say. Kids, Would you say of somebody who's younger than you that they came before you? Wouldn't that be weird? That doesn't make any sense, does it? It doesn't make sense when we're talking about somebody who's 100% human. But what we have to understand is that Jesus, John is saying that Jesus is preexistent. 
that he exists eternally. Because if you knew anything about John and, and Jesus, you, you, know, you know, first of all, that they're cousins, but you also know that John was actually born before Jesus. And not only that, but John the Baptist's ministry began before Jesus' ministry. So when John says, he existed before me, he's clearly making a statement about Jesus being God. He's clearly referring to Jesus being God incarnate. Because there's just no other way that John could say that Jesus existed before he did. So according to John the Baptist himself, he himself pales in comparison to Christ as a leader as a prophet, as a preacher, as an evangelist, as, as anything. Because Christ has a higher rank than he does. Christ was before him in every sense. He was before him chronologically. He was before him in every way imaginable. Jesus was greater than John the Baptist in every way. Jesus is the superior one. Jesus is the preeminent one. And this is why I tell people that any preacher worth their weight in salt would agree with Nicholas Zinzendorf. How would you like to have a last name like that, that, Zinzendorf? When he said that the preacher's desire must be to preach Christ, die, and be forgotten. That's bold. That's saying, I don't want any glory for myself. I don't want any attention for myself. I only want you to pay attention to Jesus and to worship him. Because not only will every single one of the world's leaders fail you, government officials will fail you, your parents will fail you, even your pastor will fail you. Yeah, even your pastor. Because every single under-shepherd, every single pastor is flawed. Every single one of us sins. We have limitations in our understanding. We have limitations in our availability. If nothing else, every single human leader, pastor or, or parent or government official or otherwise, every single human leader will ultimately fail because the day will come when they will pass into eternity. And this is how John the Baptist's ministry ended, isn't it? He was murdered by Herod. Now, suppose you were a follower of John the Baptist and that he was, in your mind, that John the Baptist was the one who was the be-all and the end-all. He was the one you placed all of your hope in. He was the one that you were exclusively following. Well, he died. He died. He, he was murdered. And your confident hope would have died with him. Your confident hope would have come to an end when John's life came to an end. And then what would you have been left with? Nobody to follow. Nobody to guide you. But what John the Apostle is trying to show us here and what John the Baptist himself attested to is that Jesus Christ is greater than any earthly leader. John the Baptist was the greatest of all the prophets and Jesus was greater yet. Jesus doesn't have the flaws and limitations that human leaders and pastors and parents have. He doesn't have a lacking in understanding like they do in any way, shape, or form. And death did not bring an end to the ministry of Christ. Instead, Jesus conquered death. He rose again on the third day in order to prove the sufficiency and the acceptability of his atoning work on Calvary. And he's now ascended into, into heaven where he sits at the right hand of the Father, where he pleads for us and where he intercedes for us always and forever. And so, you can trust in him. You should trust in him. You must trust in Jesus because he lives and he reigns forever, because he is preeminent, he is supreme, he surpasses every other option. Do you want to thrive as a Christian, any of you? Do you want to thrive in your walk with the Lord? Because if that's what you want, you can't do it without committing yourself to nurturing your relationship with Christ. For those of you who are married, 
How possible is it that you can have a healthy and thriving marriage if you don't invest a single thing in it? If you just say, I'll come to you when I need help, just leave me alone the rest of the time. How strong is your marriage going to be? Or if, if you're not married, what about a friend? What kind of friendship works that way? I'll come to you when I need you, but leave me alone the rest of the time. What kind of a friend is that? That's not a friend, right? In the same way, you cannot grow in your walk with Christ. You cannot thrive in your walk with Christ without committing yourself to nurturing that relationship with him. And you do that through regular prayer, regular Bible study, uh, regular self-examination, uh, regularly gathering with the saints on Sunday mornings for worship. You know, there, there's, a, there's certainly a sense in which the degree to which you commit yourself to these things will also correspond with how strong, with how thriving your walk with Christ is. And listen, I understand how easy it is to look at all these things, what we call means of sanctifying grace, things that grow us in our walk with Christ. It's easy to look at these, these means of sanctifying grace as something that's just optional. Because it's true that you will not lose your salvation if you don't study your Bible every day. Uh, Christ won't love you any less if you don't have the greatest prayer life. These things are true. But there's another sense in which you will lose greatly if you don't commit yourself to these things, to practicing these things regularly and nurturing your walk with Christ. I guarantee that every single one of us, when we stand before Christ one day, we will have a sense of regret that we didn't commit ourselves more wholeheartedly to these things, to nurturing our walk with Christ by availing ourselves more fully to such means of sanctifying grace. And so I urge you, as the one who's going to have to stand before the Lord one day and give an account for your souls, I urge you to commit yourself to doing this, to growing in your walk, to nurturing your relationship with Christ, and by doing it, by committing yourself to these means of grace on a regular basis. Jesus is worthy of your time. Jesus is worthy of your praise. Jesus is worthy of everything. He's preeminent. He's superior in every way to anything and everything else. And because Jesus is preeminent, because he is supreme, only Jesus is worthy of your devotion and your worship. So John the Apostle explains why John the Baptist said this, why John the Baptist would have deferred to somebody greater than he was. Look at what he says in verse 16, what John writes in verse 16. He says, For his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. Of course, the his here, he's speaking about Jesus, the one that John deferred to, the one that Jesus directed people to follow, the one who was greater than John. The reason that Jesus is better than John the Baptist or any other human leader is because no human leader, no matter how good they are, can provide the fullness of spiritual blessings that you need on a day in and day out basis. See, my job is actually a little bit similar. It's, it's basically the same as John the Baptist's job. It's not to provide you with the fullness of blessings. Rather, my job is to point you, to redirect your attention to the one who can provide to you the fullness of spiritual blessings that you need every single moment of the day. And when we understand this, we understand that when we're talking about the fullness of blessings... It means there's never been a situation and there's never going to be a situation in your life in which Jesus has no ability to provide you with exactly what you need in that moment. And it's all by grace. It's all by grace. John says, we have all received this fullness of grace. And of course, we saw last week that in one sense, all of humanity has received grace. We called that common grace. Uh, the rain falls even on the righteous and the wicked, right? But I think that 
John is speaking more specifically here about the fullness of grace that is only available to those who put their faith in Christ for salvation. The phrase that John uses to explain the all-sufficiency of what Christ is capable of providing for us is grace upon grace. You see that? Verse 16, grace upon grace. And that's a really interesting phrase. Literally translated, it would say grace for grace, uh, which I think is probably a better translation, but it doesn't make as much sense. See, the Greek word that's translated upon or, or for here uh, almost always means in place of. So what this implies then is that for those who are in Christ by grace alone, through faith alone, for those who have put their hope for salvation in Christ alone, there's never going to be a time when Christ can't provide. There is a never-ending provision of grace and heavenly blessing for us. See, you and I need one kind of grace when we're in the midst of, of trials and, and hard times, right? We need a different type of grace on days when things are going well and life feels easy. We need one grace when we're facing the temptation to sin, and we need another grace when we're facing the threat of persecution. We need one grace when we've wandered astray from the fold. And we need another kind of grace to realize our need to return to the fold. See, there are all kinds of graces that we need. But the imagery here is like an ocean. An ocean that's just filled with mercy. And there's one wave of grace after another, after another, after another, gently washing over us, cleansing us of our sin, and bestowing all of God's blessings upon us. One wave comes in, but it's soon replaced by another, which is soon gone, and it's replaced by another, and it never ends. It's an endless provision of God's grace, giving us exactly what we need for whatever it is that we're facing and whatever situation it is that we're in. John the Baptist can't do that. I can't do that. None of the prophets could do that. No human leader can do that. But Jesus, who is full, that's one of the key words here, he's full of grace and truth, and who knows you better than you know yourself. He knows what you need better than even you know what you need. He can do that. He can provide you with the grace that you need. And he lavishes. He doesn't just give us a, a minimal amount. He lavishes his grace upon his people with an infinite supply. And it's for this reason that I can say with all confidence that every Christian's life, every single Christian's life, is a testimony to this reality. Every Christian's life bears witness to the fact that in Christ. Christ, we receive grace upon grace, endless demonstrations of God's good and gracious providence unto us in Christ. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. He doesn't say he's going to bless us with every heavenly blessing. He says he has. It's a done deal. It's ours. Every blessing. Nothing held back from us. And it's only in Christ. Christ is preeminent. Christ is better. Christ is greater. Christ is supreme. And the tragedy that we so often see, in which I fear we, we all too easily become so used to, that it no longer strikes us as tragic, is that there are so, so many people who want those things, who want love, who want joy, who want acceptance and peace, who want to see that there's some kind of deeper meaning to their life that's greater than they can imagine, and yet they refuse to turn to the one, to the only one, who can truly provide these things. When the people around us prefer to find these things in the world, to find their meaning and to find joy and peace in the things of the world rather than in Christ, it's like preferring to drink water from a toilet instead of drinking water from a fresh fountain. When Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman, which we'll probably study uh, you know, in a few months, 
He speaks of of drawing water from a well, but he likened drawing from the well to looking to the world for what only Christ can give. He says this to her. He says, everyone who drinks of this water, he's pointing to a well, right? Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, he told her. In other words, this stagnant water, this worldly water will never, ever completely satisfy you. You will need to come back to it again and again and again, looking for more. See, here's the principle here. You can't find eternal contentment in temporary things. No, temporary things can never give us eternal contentment. But it's the temporary things that we're so inclined in our flesh to rely on, to look to for contentment, for peace, for love, for acceptance. But that's exactly what this woman had done, right? She had turned to romance. She would turned to promiscuity and momentary pleasure for security and satisfaction. And she'd gone through five husbands doing so, none of whom was able to satisfy her deepest needs, her deepest longings. And people are the same in our day and age, right? I mean, why do you think the divorce rate is as high as it is? Or they look to their job, or they look to their possessions, or they look to their position, or they look to their family or their friends, and it's just never enough. They have to keep looking. They have to keep drawing from this stagnant well. Because those things can't satisfy the deepest longings of our souls. So people just keep on looking, going from one worldly thing to another. But Jesus continues, talking to the Samaritan woman. He contrasts what the world has to offer with what is only found in him. He says this to her in verse 14 of chapter 4. He says, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst But the water that I will give him will become in him a a well of water springing up to eternal life. See, temporary things cannot give us eternal contentment. But Jesus can. Jesus can. Only Jesus can. So the question then is, what are you looking to for these things? What are you looking to to satisfy the deepest longings of your soul? Jesus. Jesus is preeminent. Jesus is supreme. Jesus is worthy. And because only Jesus can provide these things, only Jesus is worthy of our worship and devotion. And when we see the beauty of this gift, the gift of of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, you have to wonder... It's so simple. It sounds so easy. Why is it that people look elsewhere for joy and peace and and contentedness? Why do they look to the things of the world? Why do people insist on looking to their own righteous deeds, thereby looking to essentially the law of Moses for their hope for salvation? Most of the time, it's sinful pride possibly confusion about the purpose of the law. And there's actually a lot of that these days. There's a lot of confusion about the purpose of the Old Testament as well-known teachers are encouraging people to get unhitched from the Old Testament. That's Andy Stanley, the son of Charles Stanley, by the way, who teaches that. This is heresy. This is, it's Marcionism. But this is an indication that there is a lot of confusion about the purpose of the law. And so John continues by showing us that Christ is even preeminent, even supreme in comparison to the law. Look at verse 17 with me. He says, For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. So John isn't drawing our attention to Moses. No, Moses is another flawed leader. He's already covered that that Jesus is greater than any other worldly leader. So he's not pointing us to Moses. Rather, he's drawing our attention to what he gave his people through Moses, and that is the law. But the question is not just what did God give us through Moses, but what did God provide for us in the law? 
And I would certainly say that we shouldn't think that John is saying here that there's, uh, there's no grace and there's no truth in the law. Of course there is. The law revealed uh, all kinds of truth about God, but it didn't reveal it as fully as Jesus does. The law revealed enough truth to demonstrate our need for grace. I mean, even if you just boil it down to the Ten Commandments, somebody, uh, someone who, who understands them understands that when we break even one, uh, we break them all, we, and we break them every single day. James says, whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. Okay, let's make it even more basic than keeping Ten Commandments. There are two great commandments. What are they? That you would love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that you would love your neighbor like yourself. Now let me ask you this. Has there ever been a time in your life when you loved God so much that it literally rivaled the love that Jesus had for God? Has there ever been a time in your life when you literally could not have possibly loved God more than you did in that moment? Of course there hasn't been. You've never, for even one second in your life, upheld the first and greatest commandment. And neither have I. None of us have. We're guilty constantly of breaking the law. So what does the law do? It condemns us. It condemns us. It curses us. Paul would say to the Galatians, for as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. See, the law did and and does serve a purpose. It reveals what pleases God for one thing. It reveals what he loves. It reveals uh, what he hates. It reveals what he demands. It reveals the holiness of God. It reveals the wrath of God against sin. And it shows us over and over and over again that our lives are so corrupted by sin, that our lives are filled through and through with sinful thoughts, words, and deeds. Under the law, we have to remember, God's blessings come as a reward for obedience. What does the law say? In essence, it says, do this and and you'll be blessed. Do this and and live. Do this and, and, and you'll receive God's blessing. But if you failed, if you fail, if you you don't uphold it all, you're cursed. See, the law promised blessings as a reward for perfect obedience, but it didn't offer any help for obeying perfectly. As the famous evangelist and preacher George Whitfield once preached, he said, get to heaven on your own strength? Why, you might as well try to climb to the moon on a rope of sand. A ridiculous idea. And it's as ridiculous, the point that he was making is it's as ridiculous as trying to get your salvation through your good deeds, through adhering to the law. The law provides condemnation, but it doesn't provide salvation. In contrast to the law, Jesus brought a salvation that is received by grace. By grace, not by perfect obedience. He's the one who was perfectly obedient. We receive grace through faith in Christ. The law was never intended to be a road to salvation. Rather, it's a mirror. It's like a mirror, which when a person looks into it, when you study it, when you, when you understand it, you see it reveals your utter filth, your utter sinfulness. It's a mirror, and it was, as Paul called it, a tutor. A tutor. A tutor. Paul says in Galatians 3.24, Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. Have you, guys, have you kids ever been driving on the road and you see a sign uh, that says, if you want to go to this place, you need to turn left, or if you want to go to that place, you need to go straight? See, the law is like one of those signposts that tells you which way you need to go if you want to get to your destination. It's a tutor that leads us to Christ. A.W. Pink wrote of how the law reveals what is in the heart of man, but how grace reveals what is in the heart of God. 
The law demanded perfect righteousness of, of man, but grace, by grace, God gives us perfect righteousness. He imputes the righteousness of Christ to us. He lays our sin on Christ, and he lays Christ's perfect righteousness on us. The law is a judge that sentences us to death, but grace rises, raises us with Christ to new life. The law shows us what we must do to be accepted by God, but grace shows us what Christ did in order that we might be accepted by God. Which would you rather have, the law or Christ? It's, it's a no-brainer. Jonathan Edwards said this. He said, almost every natural man who hears of hell flatters himself that he shall escape it because of what he has done, what he is now doing, or what he intends to do. The foolish children of men miserably delude themselves by having confidence in their own strength and wisdom. End quote. And so I urge you again, as the one who has to give an account for your soul someday. Don't be that guy. Don't be the guy who, who rests, who, whose confidence for salvation rests on what you've done, how good you are. Don't look to your good deeds or, your good, or any goodness at all within you for salvation. Look to Christ. Look to Christ. He alone upheld all of the law, and his righteous perfection is yours if you will forsake all of your own attempts at righteousness and place your faith for salvation in him alone. You are not saved by works. You're saved for works. That's an important distinction to make. We are not saved by works. We are saved for good works. That's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand for us to walk in. So John the Baptist revealed something about God to us. The law reveals something about God to us. But because of his fullness of grace and truth, only Jesus can fully reveal to us who God is. Jesus is supreme. Jesus is the preeminent, full revelation of God. Look what he says in verse 18, what John says in verse 18. He continues by saying, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. The only begotten, there's that word again. He's using it in reference to Jesus. And he's saying this only begotten is God. Look what he says there. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. It's the mystery of the Trinity, something that we can't fully wrap our minds around. But what we understand is that Jesus is fully man and fully God. Remember the time that Moses pled with God, show me your glory. And what was God's response? Exodus 33, 20, he says, you cannot, see my face for, for, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. Paul would say to Timothy that God dwells in unapproachable light. But Jesus, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, took on flesh and fully revealed God to us. Only God can reveal God. Pretty simple concept. Only God can reveal God. And thus Jesus is preeminent in his ability to fully reveal God. You cannot see God in any figures of any other world religion. You cannot come to know God. You cannot come into a saving relationship with him in any way other than through Jesus. And if you're looking to the law, your relationship to God is not as a friend your relationship to him is as a criminal is to a judge. The word exegesis, is anybody familiar with that word? 
It's the word that we use in reference to uh, interpreting the Bible. Every week as I'm preparing my sermons, I do exegesis, or I exegete the scriptures. Uh, it involves all the things that are necessary for understanding what the Bible says or, or what a certain passage means. But what's interesting to note here is that the word exegesis is actually derived from the same Greek word here that gets translated as explained. Explained. So Jesus explains God. He exegetes God. Christ reveals God fully. There's no saving power in anything else. Only Jesus gives us a full understanding of who God is, allowing us to have an understanding about God that we could not have without Jesus. Jesus came to men in a way that allowed men to know and to understand God more fully, as fully as we possibly could. Apart from Christ, man is in the darkness and cannot know God. All man can know is what's revealed in nature and what's revealed in the law. But there's no saving knowledge that can be derived from nature, and there's no saving power in the law. Only Christ can reconcile man to God, because only Christ fully reveals God. Christ is preeminent. Christ is supreme. And there is nothing and there is nobody in all of creation that compares to him. Christ's power to save us is greater than the law's power to condemn us. The truth is that good deeds are necessary for your salvation, but the problem is that none of us have good deeds. Even your best deeds will not save you. And if you're counting on your own good deeds for your salvation, if you're counting on your own goodness as your hope for heaven, it is really just a rejection of Christ. And thus, your best deeds, all of your good deeds, all they do is condemn you. They do not save you. Only Jesus can save you. He is our preeminent, our supreme Savior. So whatever situation you might be facing today, whatever situation you might be facing an hour from now, whatever situation you might be facing tomorrow or next year, Christ alone is the answer. Christ alone is preeminent. Whatever grace you need, in any given moment, Jesus alone can supply it. He's preeminent. He is better. He is greater. He's holier. He's more righteous, more just, more loving, and more worthy of our praise and devotion than anything or anyone else that this world has to offer can provide. So I urge you, to look to him alone for your salvation. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that your word speaks so clearly to the futility of our own efforts to work, the pointlessness, the rebellion that's behind it. Lord, we pray that you would teach us to forsake every effort, every thing that we might perceive as good within ourselves and look only to Christ. And it's such a struggle. But thank you that you provide grace upon grace that in every situation, your grace is like an ocean washing over us, giving us what we need, sustaining us, providing for us, lavishing us with your grace. Were it not for your grace, Father, we would fall away before our next breath. And so we thank you that your grace sustains us. We thank you that it's by your grace that you drew us to Christ and that we found redemption in him. 
Thank you for the blood that was shed for the remission of our sins. Teach us to turn away from our sins and to turn to Christ more fully, that he would be glorified in our lives and that we would be able to glorify Christ through our good works that we do because we're saved, not with the idea that we'll be saved by them. Thank you for the good and perfect works of Christ on our behalf. Thank you that he bore the wrath that we deserved and gave us a righteousness that we could never earn so we can stand before you justified, guiltless, forgiven. And it's all by your grace. We thank you for that. And thank you for Christ. May he be exalted and glorified in our lives. In his name we pray. Amen.